spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before i took a breath you breathed your life in me you have been so so kind to me
sometimes on this journey I get lost in my mistakes What looks to me like weakness Is a canvas for your strength And my story isn't over My story's just begun And fail you won't define me Cause that's what my father does Yeah, fail you won't define me Cause that's what my father does Well, hi, I'm Josh, and welcome to Rabbit Creek's online campus. I am joined with Stephanie and with Drew, two of our worship leaders, and also two people that are just absolutely wonderful to be a part of a worship team together. And so we hope that you are as excited this morning as we are. And we're going to get kicked off with a new song for Rabbit Creek, but hopefully not a new song for you. And if it is, you can look it up, and that is Grave to Garden. I 
search the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise And treasures of faith Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together And every desire Now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you. Oh, I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failure. You're the only one that can save. You're the only one that can love us in the way that we were created to be loved. You're the only one that can lead us to a life of peace, a life of hope, a life of promised redemption and of eternal life with you in glory. We love you. We praise you. We thank you that we can worship you. Thank you for that honor. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to take just a second and give you a couple of brief announcements. The first is that I hope you have a device with you, if you're a device user, to where you can pull out your Church Center app 
And on your church center app, you can do a couple of things. You can stay in touch with your church by checking out the events that are on there. And yes, Rabbit Creek Church is still doing events. We just got back from our church camp out this last weekend. It was a great success. If you weren't there, you did miss out. But we hope to see you next year when we do that. There's also some student stuff going on. And instead of me trying to give you an announcement on that, I'm going to ask Pastor Corey if he can just step onto the set here for just a second. Still Stephanie's microphone. And Corey, if you could fill them in on that, that would be great. Yeah, I don't appreciate that you guys make me match your maroon scheme just so I could be on camera with you. Well, somebody's got to. I think that was a little bit much. <laughs> so couple of stuff coming up for students. We are, in fact, looking at starting back for Tuesday night game nights. That's going to happen after school kicks off. But the biggest thing, the most important thing happening is actually happening what will be tonight for you guys. That's August 16th. It's going to be at 6 p.m. We're going to have a parent meeting where Drew and I have a chance to sit down with you as parents. Some of you are going to get to be here in person. Some of you are going to be here by Zoom link, whatever's most comfortable for you. And we want to have a conversation with you about how can we meet you where you are as families? What can we do? What can we put together? As you go into a new academic year, we have some ideas for that and how we can help with that. But how can we do effective student ministry in the lives of your teenagers? And we would love to come alongside you and partner with you as we do that. So that's really the big thing. It's going to be um, what is effectively, as, as they see this recording tonight, August 16th, 6 p.m., um, and they can get more information about that by watching the student after show, which is going to be brilliant. I know that because Drew and I haven't recorded it yet. It's live in like 15 minutes. It is, and we're going to record that. You guys can see that right as this service wraps up. Your students are going to get a chance to do application from this Sunday's sermon, and uh, children's are, are going to have the same opportunity because Lori's doing the same thing. So if you've got kids of any age, you want to hang out after this with them and watch those after shows so that they get some application, some announcements for them and that kind of stuff. So. Where is it going to be at for the physical meeting for your parents tonight? Yeah, thanks. The, the physical meeting for that is actually going to be in the big activity room right here behind Bloom Coffee okay. that has always been our student uh, ministry building since we built it, actually. We built a great big brand new thing that's called the Gaga Ball Pit back there. It's going to be a blast. All right, so the address for that is 12100-12100 Old Seward Highway, if you're not familiar with that. And if they're looking for the Zoom link, they can find that. Um, I, that should be available by email. Or they can get in touch with me. Uh, my email's on the church website. You can email me if you don't have that link. It's just Corey, C-O-R-Y, at rabbitcreekchurch.org. Um, for some obvious reasons, given the fun people have had with Zoom links, we're going to protect that just a little bit. Cool. But we'd love for you to be able to do that. If you register for that on the church center website with the church center app, yep. you will get an email with that Zoom link as we get closer to it as well. So another great way to use that church center app. Very cool. Thanks, Corey. So, yeah. Oh, thanks, so Stephanie. One of the other ways that my family uses the church center app is we actually use it as our primary way that we give tithes and offerings to the church. It's simple. It's easy. It's protected. Um, and it's one of those things that's just quick and easy to pull out and to punch in our tithe when we do so. Uh, and it makes life a little bit easier for us instead of having to set up or go around or remember to write a check or do the different things there. So I hope that you can find it a blessing. Um, but other than that, today is not just simply about announcements, though all of those things are great. It's also celebrating what a beautiful name that our Savior has and the Savior that is Jesus. So, Stephanie, would you lead us in what a beautiful name? <clears throat> I will share that this song has gotten me through a lot because when I focus on my problems, that's all I see. But when I focus on the name of Jesus, the powerful name, the wonderful name, the beautiful name, He brings peace. So as we worship with this song, just know that the name of Jesus is above the sickness, the disease, the financial struggle, anything that you are facing today, the name of Jesus is over it. Just speak the name. If you know the words of this song, please join us in worship. But if you just need to say the name of Jesus, the powerful name of Jesus, just say it. He is over all of, he is above all.
Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. We pray, God, that the words that Pastor Mark speaks would not be his words, but your words, inspired and empowered by the truth of your love and your goodness. Thank you for your spirit. Holy Spirit, would you teach us? In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I'm so glad you're with us today as we continue in our online services. We look forward to being back in person, but in the meantime, it's great to be able to connect with you this way and know we'll continue to do this even as we are able to get back together in one room together. Today, we're going to continue on with our series going through the Gospel of Mark. Mark, the Gospel writer, had an agenda. Now, when I say someone has an agenda, sometimes we think of that in a negative context. But this is not negative. This says that Mark wrote on purpose. Mark know, knew what he was trying to communicate. As inspired by the Holy Spirit, Mark had an agenda. And his agenda was this, to declare the good news of Jesus Christ. You recall in the very beginning of his writing, he says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The beginning of the story of Jesus Two weeks ago, we were able to launch this series talking about that very beginning where Mark jumps past Jesus' birth and jumps past any kind of stories of Jesus' youth and goes right to Jesus' introduction into ministry, to his baptism and his temptation in the wilderness. And we see Jesus begin his ministry right from the start in Mark. Then last week, Pastor Corey brought you a message on story, how Jesus loved to teach through parable. Today, as we look into the latter part of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5, we're going to focus on Jesus' power. We're going to find in the latter part of chapter 4 and the first part of chapter 5, Jesus' unique power. William Lane put it this way about those verses. He said, these verses reveal Jesus' sovereignty over sea and wind, demonic possession and death. They've been brought together as a unit to illustrate vanquishing of powers hostile to God. As we're going to look at these passages together, I want us to think about Jesus' power over nature itself. We're going to see his power over demonic oppression, and we're going to see his power over sickness and even death. We want to begin in Mark chapter 4 in regard to Jesus' control over nature. And we go to Mark chapter 4, verse 35. That day when evening came... Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also others with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. As I hear this story, I'm reminded of the beginning of all of scripture. Genesis 1, 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. We see in Genesis chapter 1, Jesus, as a part of the triune God, speaking into chaos. In the beginning, there was chaos. In the beginning, there was disorder. And the Bible tells us that, that God is Father and Spirit is Son, as we compare Genesis 1 and John chapter 1, that there is a great creation activity that takes chaos and brings it to order. The psalmist reflected upon the same truth. This is in Psalm 33, verse 6 through 7. It says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. As we think about Mark chapter 4, as we think about Genesis chapter 1, 
As we think about Psalm 33, we are reminded that God can take chaos and turn it into order. And we see this in Mark chapter 4. It's a wonderful story. Jesus is tired. He needs a nap. His disciples take him across on the water, and he's asleep because he is taking that nap that he needed. And in the midst of this, he is calm. The creator of all things, the sovereign one is calm, but his disciples are truly disturbed. They're truly distressed. So they cry out and they wake him. And what Jesus does is beautifully simple and sovereign in his power. He says, quiet, be still. Quiet, be still. The word there in the Greek is phimeo. Phimeo. And what we find there is a word that actually translates into muzzle. To muzzle. In other words, the, the wind and the waves are being mouthy. Jesus wanted to shut the jaws of the voice of the waves and the wind. He muzzled the wind. He muzzled the waves. We can picture him with his finger over his lips saying, quiet, be still. And what was the response of the disciples? The response of the disciples is, who is this? Who is this one who has the power to even do what we have just seen done with our very own eyes? Mark makes it very clear as he echoes the psalmist, as he echoes the creation story, that Jesus has power over nature. We're also going to see that Mark goes from this story to another story where we're going to find that Jesus not only has power over nature, but power over demonic activity. We find this in chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. We read these verses. They went across the lake to the region of Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of the man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged at Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission. And the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Another fascinating story that Mark places here in the gospel, where he tells us, that not only does Jesus have power over nature, but Jesus has power over things that are not of this world. That Jesus has power even over demonic activity. We would call it possession. That demons have possessed this man. Known by one name, Legion, but many in number. These demons are causing this man to be loved by none. Here's a man loved by none, shamed by all. But just as Jesus loved the twelve, Jesus loves the one. And so this one loved by none is now the one loved by Jesus. Jesus steps into his story. Jesus steps into this man's life. Think about the man's life for a minute. At some age, he became possessed by demons. Demons indwelled him, and therefore the community feared him. They chained him with irons and put him out by the cemetery, by the graveyard. But because of the demonic oppression and possession, he had strength beyond human power, and so he'd even break the irons. I believe he was not only distressed by the demons, but distressed by the loneliness, distressed by the misunderstanding, distressed by not being able to be in community. 
And so he cuts himself and he wails and he moans and he wants to be fresh again because we see voices here in the text. In addition to the pure word of Jesus, we see the voices of the demons. We don't hear the voice of the man yet. He's overwhelmed by demonic activities, overwhelmed by a life of rejection. William Lane put it this way about what the demons did with Jesus when they call him by name. It says the full address is not a confession of Jesus' dignity, but a des desperate attempt to gain control over him or to render him harmless in accordance with the common assumption of the period that the use of the precise name of an adversary gave one mastery over him. I want you to think about God saying, let there be light, and, and naming the waters, and naming the sky, and naming the heavens, naming the things that he has created. I want you to think about Adam naming the animals, or parents naming their children. We have this assumption that when someone names another person, when someone names another creature, when someone names another object, that person has control over that object. And we'd certainly say this about God. But we would not say that about ourselves. And certainly the demons do not have claim upon who Jesus is. See, they have fooled themselves in thinking that if they can identify Jesus, the one they know, but the one in whom they do not believe in faith, the one they know to be Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, they declare that hoping, in Lane's words, to overcome the adversary. But Jesus will have none of it. Jesus is king of kings. The demons are servants of the prince of this world, Satan, but Jesus is king of kings. He will not fall for this. And so notice what Jesus does in verses 9 and 10. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. And so they, along with pigs, receive an over-the-cliff dive. This is a tragic experience for the pigs, but a great freedom for the man. Now, side note, don't get too hung up on the pigs. The answer of why would that happen, and is it fair for the farmer? Because if we do, we miss the point. In fact, we would be in company with the villagers that are worried about their pigs and not worried about the man. They feared the man, and now the man is healthy, but they don't want anything to do with the man because what they want is the pigs. I think there's a story in there. I think there's an important lesson in there that when we look at things and think that we have it figured out, and then God steps in and does something powerful, sometimes we miss the point. Well, this man did not miss the point. I want you to look at verses 18 and 20 as we pick up later in the story. It says, as Jesus was getting to the boat, the man who had been, notice the past tense, had been, demon-possessed, begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell the Diocopolis, how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Go tell the community. Nickname the ten cities. Go, go tell this community about what I've done for you. What the Lord has done for you. It reminds me of a story in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John tells a story of this woman. Who is a Samaritan woman. A woman on the outskirts socially and religiously and morally an outcast of society very much like this man is different issues but outcast nevertheless and in that story the samaritan woman is the hero of the story save jesus himself jesus the ultimate hero and then the samaritan woman and the samaritan woman after being forgiven and being given a, given a new chance goes back to the samaritan village and preaches the word of god and people come and repent and receive Jesus. We see the same message. Jesus loved the man. He welcomed the man. He embraced the man. He freed the man, but he knew that this man's best calling was back in with his people on the other side of the sea where Jesus usually was. So as Jesus would go across the boat, he, this man 
formerly demon-possessed, is now a proclaimer of the good news. The message Mark is getting across, that here is a man who's been freed of demonic oppression because of the power of Jesus, and now he goes and tells the people. So the man went away, it says, and notice the last sentence, and all the people were amazed. Wouldn't you be? A man who'd been cutting himself, who had been frantically running around a graveyard, is now put together and telling the story of Jesus. We see that Jesus has power over nature. We see that Jesus has power over demons and demonic activity. And next, as Mark continues with his writing, we see that Jesus has power over sickness and even death. In the 21st verse of Mark chapter 5, we will pick up. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, so he's left the ten cities, he, he's back on the other side of the lake. A large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Here is a powerful story indeed two stories, of Jesus having power. We notice that there is a man who has faith in Jesus, an unlikely man. It's often the case in the stories. And here is an unlikely man who has a daughter who is sick. And along his journey, as Jesus goes with him, he encounters a woman who has had a bleeding issue for 12 years, and Jesus has compassion. And so Jesus heals. Jesus brings fullness. Not only does Jesus bring understanding, not only does Jesus bring order into chaos, not only does Jesus bring healing from oppression and possession, but Jesus also brings this great healing into moments of hurt. Yes, spiritual hurt, but also physical hurt. And not only of the one physically hurting, but also the people hurting alongside, who are grieving at another person's grief, at another person's illness. And Jesus, who is the King of Kings, having all authority over all things, speaks into these journeys, speaks into these stories. The woman is healed, the child is healed. Now Mark wants to make another point here. As we've seen the power of Jesus, we see that Jesus didn't show his power simply to show his power. Jesus was not a show-off, in other words. In fact, just the opposite. Look at verse, look at verse 43. Speaking of Jesus, it says, He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. So you have the story of Jesus heading to heal the daughter. And in the middle of it, you hear the woman's story of being healed from bleeding after 12 years. And now this 12-year-old girl is healed, is brought to life. And Jesus says this, don't tell anybody, just get her something to eat. He meets another physical need as he's shown his power. But his power is for those people. His power is taken and shared with others. His power is there even at the touch of his cloak, and his power is there in the family with the daughter. He didn't want people talking about his power. He wanted to display his power so the Father received glory, and so people's lives could be changed. These are miraculous stories. These are wonderful stories. And all throughout, there's a question that Mark's trying to get us to ask and to answer. He's leading us on this journey. 
We are amazed in the very beginning of Mark where he passed the test of the ultimate enemy. We see him as he goes and tells stories that are simple yet profound. And we see him bringing his power over nature and power over the sickness and the death and the demonic. And we ask this question, who is this? The disciple said, who is this that he has such power to do, do these, these things? And through all throughout Mark's gospel, he's going to be asking the question through story and through history, who is this person? I want us to make sure we know the answer to that question. Because again, Mark wrote with an agenda, and his agenda is this, to tell the good news of Jesus Christ, to explain to us who Jesus is and know what Jesus did and why he did it on our behalf. And so here we come again to that question, who is this? This is Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is Jesus who has power over nature. This is Jesus who has power over the demonic. This is Jesus who has power over sickness and health. And Jesus has power over you and over me. God is sovereign. And at the same time, he has given us great choice. We call that free will. And he invites you into a relationship with him where you can choose to follow Jesus Christ. And as you do so, you invite him into your life so the power of the Holy Spirit can live within you and take over who you are. And that's the invitation that Mark brings us into. We must recognize the authority of Jesus and bow before it in a way that we respect him and honor him and understand his unique identity. And so as we continue through this Gospel of Mark, I encourage you to continue to read and read with the question in mind, who is this? Explore who Jesus is. Explore the stories Mark is getting across to us because I have an agenda. Mark, the imperfect one, preaching from Mark, who has been inspired by God in his perfection, speaks to this writer named Mark, and now I, Mark, speak to you as well, joining Mark, the gospel writer, with an agenda. And my agenda is this, to declare the goodness and the good news of Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. I hope you hear it. Let us have ears to hear. And let's continue to do this together. Thanks again for watching. And I'll see you again online next week and in the room as soon as possible. God bless. Father, we thank you for this great opportunity to hear from your word. Help it to change who we are and help us to make a difference in your name. Thank you, Jesus, for your power. We recognize it and we bow before you as our sovereign God.